Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'd like to begin this talk with a demo. OK. So I'm now loading Abbey Word. Abbey Word is an open source word processing program that allows its users to open and edit Microsoft Word files. Let's open the Microsoft Word document. And as you may have noticed, Abbey Word just crashed. Here's what's going on. When Abbey Word opens a document, it builds a data structure to hold that document. Unfortunately, this particular Microsoft Word document causes Abbey Word to build an inconsistent data structure. When Abbey Word attempts to process this data structure, it crashes, even though the Microsoft Word file is perfectly valid. In this talk, I will talk about a technique to repair damaged data structures. Let's run a version of Abbey Word that incorporates this technique. Now let's go back and try to load that same Microsoft Word document. Open. As you can see, Abbey Word can successfully open this document. Furthermore, you can see that I can edit this document. It's important to note that we have not removed the bug from Abbey Word. Abbey Word still builds an inconsistent data structure when it loads this Microsoft Word file. What our technique does is repair the damaged data structure to enable Abbey Word to successfully open and process this document. Today, I will talk about how this technique works and the experience we've had applying this technique to a variety of different applications. OK, let me switch back. The, so the answer to that question is uh, a little interesting in that you don't lose anything because of repair. But if you open in a word, you won't see the exact same thing. Yeah, but if you open it in the next version of Abbey Word that incorporates the fix to this particular bug, you'll see the same thing. Yeah. So there are differences, but it's, due, it's Abbey Word's fault. Not for this particular repair. You could, uh, the repair algorithm could conceivably cause uh, text to be dropped from the document. Okay. Um, not for this particular bug, but yeah. Okay. okay. So here's the motivation for my research. Programs typically maintain state in the form of data structures. For example, Abbey Word uses a piece table to uh, store the contents of documents. Software bugs or other events can cause these data structures to become damaged. This damage yields data structures which violate the basic consistency assumptions that software makes with the states of the data structures that they manipulate. These inconsistencies, if not corrected, will likely cause the program to produce unacceptable results, or as in the case of Abbey Word, even crash. Examples of such inconsistencies include data structures with missing elements, linked lists with inappropriate sharing or dating link references, and data structures with other type of inconsistent values. Ideally, what you would like is a repair algorithm to repair the damaged data structures to enable the program to continue to execute successfully. However, it's hard to imagine how such a repair algorithm could function unless it had some idea of the consistency properties the program expects from its data structures. 
What we actually deliver is a repair arm which takes in a consistency specification from the developer and a broken data structure and delivers a consistent data structure that enables the program to continue to execute successfully. So what can we reasonably expect the repair arm to generate? Our repair arm generates a data structure that satisfies the consistency properties given by the developer and that is heuristically close to the original broken data structure. Notice that it's not reasonable to expect the repair arm to produce the same data structure as a hypothetical correct program would produce as a buggy program may have destroyed some of the, no destroyed some of the information or never even generate this information. But our goal is to generate a consistent data structure that's enough to enable the program to continue to execute successfully. So where is repair likely to be useful? I acknowledge that repair is not the right thing to do in all cases. In some cases, fail stop behavior may be preferable. I believe that repair is of limited use when it's simply acceptable to reboot the system. However, the reboot solution requires that the user is willing to lose all the volatile state in the program, that the system can tolerate the downtime associated with rebooting, and most importantly, that the cause of the error go away after the reboot. Because of this last requirement, repair is especially likely to be useful for persistent data structures, such as file systems and application files like AbbeyWord, in which inconsistencies persist across reboot. Repair is also likely to be useful for autonomous systems, which must function without human in intervention, and critical systems, which interact with physical phenomena, which may not be able to tolerate the downtime associated with rebooting. Many of these systems have a largely independent subcomputations. A failure in one of these subcomputations may deny the flow of execution to the remaining subcomputations. Repair of the state associated with that one subcomputation enables the program to successfully execute the remaining subcomputations. Finally, many of these systems have a moving time window in which damaged data structures are eventually purged from the system, returning the system to a completely correct state. Here's our basic approach. The system sets, starts out with a set of broken bits. It translates the broken bits into an abstract model of the data structure. It checks the consistency properties on this abstract model, and if it finds any inconsistencies, performs a repair on the abstract model. But of course, what we really want to do is repair the data structure. So the system translates the abstract repairs into the corresponding concrete data structure updates. The end result of the repair process is a consistent data structure. This figure shows how the responsibility for repair uh, are partitioned between the developer and the system. The circles correspond to developer responsibilities, and the squares correspond to system responsibilities. The developer provides a set of model definition rules, which specify the translation between the data structure and the abstract model, and a set of consistency constraints that tells the system which abstract models are consistent. The system automatically translates the data structures into the corresponding abstract model, automatically checks the consistency constraints on this abstract model, and if it finds an inconsistency, automatically performs an abstract repair on the model. And then finally, automatically translates these abstract repairs into the corresponding concrete data structure updates. So why do we use the abstract model? Different objects play different conceptual roles as the computation progresses. And these different conceptual roles may have different consistency properties. The model construction separates objects into sets based upon reachability properties. As the uh, data structure in which an object participates in may determine its role in the computation and based upon field values, as the uh, values of an object's field may determine its role in the computation. The developer can then specify different constraints for the objects in these different sets. Furthermore, it provides a means to manage complexity. There are two sources of complexity in the consistency constraints. The complexity from the data structure representation and the complexity inherent in the consistency property. The uh, abstract model provides an appropriate division of complexity. The data structure representation complexity is encapsulated in the model definition rules, and the consistency property complexity is encapsulated in the model consistency constraints. An illustration of the power of this approach is that the underlying data structure representation can be changed without modifying the model consistency constraints. Here's an outline for the remainder of the talk. I'll use a file system example to illustrate how the system works. I'll talk about the experience we've had applying the system to a variety of benchmarks. I'll discuss a tool we've developed to automatically infer specifications. I'll discuss related work, future directions for the research, and then conclude. In this figure, you can see a graphical depiction for the of the file system in our example and the corresponding C-like data structure definitions. From the C-like data structure definitions, you can see that the disk contains a reference to a special uh, block bitmap. This block bitmap contains an array of bits, one bit for each block in the file system. 
the bit is set to true if the corresponding block is used, and free or false if the corresponding block is free. This is followed by an array of directory entries, with each directory entry containing the name of the file and a reference to the first block in the file. And this is followed by an array of blocks, with each block containing a reference in the to the next block in the file. So the blocks are linked together uh, using a linked list type structure. And this is followed by an array of bytes containing the file's actual data. Our abstract model con is composed of sets of objects in relations between, this op uh, between these objects. This set of relation model is similar to that used in many object modeling languages. Many of these object modeling languages include a graphical depiction of the object model. And here we show a graphical depiction of the abstract model for this example. The boxes correspond to sets. The filled vertical arrows represent partitions. The empty vertical arrows represent subsets. The directed edges uh, represent relations. From this graphical depiction, we can see that the set of blocks is partitioned into the set of use blocks and the set of free blocks. The set of use blocks contain the blocks in the files and the special bitmap block. And the set of free blocks contain the uh, pool of unused blocks. And we can see that the next relation is used to model the linking relation between the blocks, and that the block status relation maps blocks to the U status according to the special bitmap block. At the bottom, we can see the corresponding textual description that the tool uses. In this figure, I present the model translation specification for the example. This specifies how the concrete data structure is translated into sets of objects and relations between these objects. This uh, translation is specified using a set of model definition rules. Each model definition rule is of the form quantifier. Condition on the concrete data structure implies an inclusion constraint in the abstract model. The example contains the six model definition rules shown in this figure. The uh, first model definition rule gives the rule for adding the first block in a file to the U set. The second model definition rule traces out the linking relation between these uh, blocks to construct the next relation. The uh, third model definition rule gives the rule for adding subsequent blocks in a file to the U set. The fourth model definition rule tells us that blocks which are not used should be placed in the free set. The fifth model definition rule gives the rule for constructing the bitmap set. And the final model definition rule gives the rule for constructing the block status relation from the content of the bitmap block. In this figure, you can see the concrete representation of the file system and the corresponding abstract representation. From the abstract representation, you can see that blocks 2 and 3 are used and that blocks 0 and 1 are free. Notice that the bitmap set is empty. A side effect of the bitmap being, set being empty is that the block status relation isn't constructed. And we'll see that this is a problem for the file system later. So now I've discussed how the system constructs a model. How are the consistency properties of this model specified? And how does the system uh, check the consistency of the data structures? In this figure, you can see the consistency constraints for the example. The first constraint ensures that the bitmap set contains exactly one block. This constraint helps ensure that the uh, block bitmap exists in the file system and is a uh, specific example of a more general class of constraints that simply make sure that data structures exist. The next two constraints make sure that the uh, bitmap block correctly records whether blocks are used or free. And the final constraint helps to ensure that blocks are not shared between two files. From this figure, you can see that the bitmap set is empty, which violates the constraint shown on the uh, top line. Now I've discussed how the consistency properties are checked. What happens when the system finds a violation of consistency property? Notice that a consistency constraint provides specific bindings for the quantified variables. This is important because it reduces a repair problem to the problem of repairing a constraint for a specific binding. Uh, note that we can always rewrite the body of the constraint in disjunctive normal form, ors of ands. An important property of this form is that if you satisfy any conjunction in the disjunctive normal form of constraint, the entire constraint is satisfied. And we can use this property to build a repair strategy. For a violated constraint, simply choose a conjunction to satisfy and repair each of the basic propositions that make up that conjunction. So now I've just uh, reduced the repair problem to the problem of repairing individual basic propositions. What uh, basic propositions do, does our system support? And how does the system repair violations of these uh, basic propositions? 
The first type of basic proposition is an inequality constraint on the value of a numerical field. For example, v dot r equals e. To repair a violation of this type of basic proposition, the, the system computes the right-hand side of the expression and assigns the left-hand side to the appropriate value. The second type of uh, basic proposition is the constraint on the presence of the required number of objects. This type of basic proposition is typically used to ensure that data structures exist. This uh, to repair a violation of this type of basic proposition, the system removes or inserts objects to or from the set. The third type of basic proposition is a constraint on the topology of the region surrounding an object. To repair violations of this type of basic proposition, the system removes or inserts tuples to or from the relation. And the final type of basic proposition is inclusion constraint. To repair violations of this type of constraint, the system removes or adds the object of tuple to or from the set of relation. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the way the system currently takes care of that is that C is a constant. Um, and you can also rewrite this constraint, say, if you want um, some variable equals to the size of some set, you can write that using the uh, first type of basic proposition. So they're really different. In, in the current system, they're really two different types of constraints. But you could easily imagine uh, a system where if you could write a variable on the right-hand side, where it would essentially generate two uh, distinct type of or two distinct repairs for a given uh, basic proposition. So that's probably something that would be better to wait till a little bit later. Um, I'll, if you have two distinct options when the repair algorithm is running at runtime, it essentially tries to compute. Uh, a cost function for one repair and a cost function for the other repair and chooses the cheapest cost. Um, but there are other constraints on choosing repair uh, when the repair is generated. And I'll talk about that later. OK, so to repair the violated constraint shown in the figure, the system moves the block from the free set to the bitmap set. So now I've told you how the system performs repairs to the abstract model. But of course, what we really want to do is repair the data structure. So how do we translate repairs from the abstract model to the data structure? Okay. We use goal-directed reasoning to construct concrete data structure updates that implement the abstract repairs. Notice that all the abstract repairs either add or remove a tuple or object to or set a relation. So the goal is to find a concrete data structure update with the same effect as the abstract repair. To do this, the repair algorithm finds the model definition rules that construct the relevant set of relation, and then uses the following basic strategy. For removals, appropriately falsify the guards of all of these model de definition rules. And for additions, appropriately satisfy the guard of one of these model definition rules. In the example, the repair algorithm repaired the model by performing an abstract repair that added block zero to the bitmap set. Let's take a look at how goal-directed reasoning constructs a corresponding concrete data structure update. The repair algorithm begins by examining the model definition rules to find the model definition rule that constructs the bitmap set. And as you can see here, the fifth model definition rule is the only model definition rule that adds a block to the bitmap set. The goal is to make this model definition rule add block zero to the bitmap set. To do this, the expression in the inclusion condition of the uh, model definition rule must be equal to block zero. This constraint shown on the last line here. To satisfy this constraint, the repair algorithm generates a data structure update that sets the block bitmap field equal to the index of block zero in the block array. And here you can see the result of the data structure update being performed on the file system. The block bitmap field has been changed from minus five to a zero. Block zero, cor or zero corresponds to the first block in the file system. 
So I presented goal-directed reasoning as though it occurs when the repairs are performed. However, this reasoning actually occurs when the specifications are compiled into a repair algorithm because the specification compiler needs to know a priori that it can successfully generate the required repair actions. The specific specification compiler begins by considering all the possible ways in which a constraint can be violated. For example, for the constraint the size of the bitmap set equals 1, it considers that the constraint is violated by the bitmap set being empty. To repair this type of violation, it generates an abstract repair that chooses a block in the free set and adds that block to the, the bitmap set. It then attempts to generate potentially multiple concrete data structure updates that implement this abstract repair. To do this, it binds the relevant model definition rules I discussed earlier and uses goal-directed reasoning to generate the following concrete data structure update that sets a block bitmap field equal to the index of the block in the block array. However, for this update to be sensical, the block selected by the abstract repair must be a member of the block array. To check this, the specification compiler uh, examines the abstract repair and determines that the abstract repair selects a block from the free set. So it suffices to show that all blocks in the free set are members of the block array. To check this, the system finds the model definition rule that constructs the block array. And as you can see here from the last line, uh, that all blocks in the free set are indeed part of the block array. So the concrete data structure update is valid. In many cases, a broken data structure may require multiple repairs. So after each concrete data structure update, the system reconstructs the model, reevaluates the consistency constraints, and then performs any additional required repairs. In this, you can see an updated graphical depiction of our approach. The new depiction takes into account that after the concrete data structure update is performed, the model is reconstructed, the consistency properties are reevaluated, and then additional repairs are performed as required. In this figure, you can see the recomputed model for our example. Notice that the block status relation now maps blocks to Boolean values. The system then reevaluates the consistency constraints and finds many violations of the two consistency properties shown here that the block status relation maps used blocks to the Boolean value true and free blocks to the Boolean value false. The system repairs these violations by assigning the block status relation to the appropriate value from the right-hand side of the expression. Finally, the system applies the corresponding concrete data structure updates to the file system. From this, uh, here you see the repaired file system, and you can see that the block bitmap exists, that the bits corresponding to used blocks are set to 1, and that the bits corresponding to free blocks are set to 0. Okay. Oh, that's a good question. Um, you probably want to hold off in about a second or two. Okay, so this repair strategy brings up a few questions. Uh, first, isn't it possible for the repair of one constraint to validate another constraint? And the answer to this question is yes. So if it's possible for the repair of one constraint to invalidate another, uh, another constraint, how about the possibility of an infinite repair loop in which the repair of one constraint invalidates a second constraint and the repair of that second constraint invalidates the original constraint. So the answer to this question, as uh, Trishal asked, is that we statically check that the specifications have no cyclic repair dependencies between constraints. As a result of this uh, static check, all repair sequences terminate, and repair can only fail because of resource limitations. A side effect of the static check is that we automatically rule out unsatisfiable specifications. Okay, so this figure shows part of the repair dependence graph for the example. The system uses the repair dependence graph to reason about the interaction between repair actions, uh, the abstract model, and consistency constraints. The rounded boxes in this graph correspond to conjunctions in the disjunctive normal form of the graph. The uh, ellipses correspond to abstract repairs. The boxes correspond to concrete data structure updates. And the circles capture effects of repair actions on the abstract model. The edges capture dependencies between these nodes. For example, the uh, edge from node 1 to node 2 captures the fact that in order to repair the conjunction represented by node 1, the system may need to perform the abstract repair represented by node 2. The edge from node 2 to node 4 captures the fact that the abstract repair that adds a block to the bitmap set 
because the model definition rule number six to be true for a new binding, thereby adding new tuples to the block status relation. And the edge from node two to node three captures the fact that in order to implement the abstract repair represented by node two, the system needs to perform the concrete data structure update represented by node three. Okay. So the absence of uh, cycles in this graph implies that the corresponding repair algorithm terminates. Unfortunately, this graph contains a cycle shown in red. However, it turns out that we have an alternate abstract repair that can be performed instead of the abstract repair represented by node 8. It turns out that the abstract repair represented by node 6 can be performed. That sets the tuple, or that replaces the tuple f comma true with a tuple f comma false in the block status relation. As a result, we can rem the repair algorithm doesn't actually need to perform the abstract repair represented by node 8 and we can remove this node from the graph. Now the graph is cyclic, and the corresponding repair algorithm terminates. In general, if the repair dependence graph contains a cycle, the specification compiler attempts to remove nodes to remove the cycle subject to the constraints that it leaves at least one conjunction node for each constraint, at least a sufficient abstract repairs for each conjunction, at least one data structure update node for each abstract repair. If the specification compiler removes a node, the corresponding repair action is never performed by the generated repair algorithm. These restrictions help ensure that the system has a valid repair option for every constraint. So when should the system test for consistency and perform repairs? My system supports multiple options. For persistent data structures, repair can either be an independent activity or repair can be performed when the data is written out or read in. The key issue for volatile data structures in a running program is that the program may legitimately but temporarily violate the consistency constraints. It's important that we do not check the consistency constraints during these time periods or perform repairs. As a result, the developer has essentially three options. The developer can choose to keep repair under the developer's control, in which the developer simply annotates the source code uh, with the places that the specification should hold. The developer can choose to use a transaction-based approach in which the developer identifies transaction starts and ends and repairs performed at the start end or both. Finally, the developer can choose to use a failure-driven approach in which the system simply waits until the program fails, repairs performed, and then the uh, program's restarted from the latest safe point. Okay, so we used our repair tool with five different benchmarks. Abbey Word, an open source word processing program, an x86 emulator, uh, CTAS, an air traffic control tool, the uh, a simplified Linux file system, and the FreeCiv interactive game. For each of these benchmarks, we developed a specification. This took very little development time on the order of days, not weeks. And most of the time was spent understanding the source code for FreeCiv and CTAS. For each of these benchmarks, we developed a workload and either identified a pre-existing bug, or if we couldn't find a pre-existing bug, used fault insertion. We sometimes use fault insertion because the process of identifying and triggering real bugs seriously complicates the uh, testing of the repair algorithm. We then ran each of the benchmarks with and without repair. Abbey Word is an open source word processing program that contains approximately 360,000 lines of C++ code. Abbey Word represents documents using a piece table. This piece table contains a doubly linked list of document fragments. The consistency constraints for Abbey Word are that the piece table contains the section fragment, the paragraph fragment, and that the doubly linked list of fragments is well formed. And as you saw earlier, here's a screenshot of Abbey Word. So as you saw in the demo, without repair, Abbey Word crashes when loading the document. And with repair, Abbey Word is able to successfully open and process the document. At MIT, the architect, oh. OK, so the bug is that. Um, and sometimes when it imports Microsoft Word documents, it'll sometimes try to append text to this piece table before it's uh, hit the part of my, the Microsoft Word document that causes it to essentially initialize the data structure. Right? So essentially try to append text to uh, this piece table before you've added the uh, fragments that uh, tell Abby Word that you've had the beginning of a section and the beginning of a paragraph. So uh, the, 
the specification makes sure that whenever you, that is a condition to uh, appending any fragment to uh, this doubly linked list, that the doubly linked list is well formed, that the paragraph and section fragments exist. Okay, so the model we expect people to use a system with is essentially you write your program, and whenever you develop a data structure, you write the consistency properties that you want to be true of that data structure. So in parallel with the development effort. Now you're probably wondering what was the how do we test this? And there's a small problem in testing that you actually want to find bugs, and you don't want to waste time writing consistency specification for you know every data structure except for the buggy data structure. So the testing somewhat reflects, uh, reflects the um, realities of you know, testing systems. OK. OK, so at MIT, the architecture group has developed the raw processor. This processor consists of a grid of interconnected computational tiles. One issue with this processor is that it cannot run x86 binaries. To address this issue, the raw group has developed a parallelized x86 emulator. This emulator maintains an L2 cache of translated x86 assembly language instructions. It attempts to maintain a constant L2 cache size. So the consistency property for this benchmark is that the computed size of the L2 cache is consistent with its actual size. Our workload for this benchmark is gzip. The x86 emulator contained a pre-existing bug that sometimes adds the size of the cache item twice when the item is inserted and it only subtracts the size of a cache item once when it's removed. As a result of this bug, without repair, the actual cache size eventually goes to zero, and when this happens, the x86 emulator crashes. With repair, the actual cache size is the same as the computed size, and the program runs correctly. CTES is a set of air traffic control tools used for managing traffic, planning the arrival of aircraft, visualizing the flow of aircraft, and planning conflict-free shortcuts. CTAS is deployed in seven of the 21 centers controlling air traffic across the United States. CTAS contains approximately one million lines of C and C++ code. In this sticker, you can see a, a screenshot of the airspace surrounding the FW. The little icons in this graph, course, or in this figure, correspond to airplanes. The uh, regions correspond to the sectors of airspace under the control of the DFW center, and the little dots along the path correspond to waypoints. Aircraft normally fly from one waypoint to another waypoint. But you can imagine that sometimes passengers or the pilots would like to bypass several intermediate waypoints and just take a shortcut. And so the screenshot, this screenshot shows CTAS being used to explore routing a plane directly to, to its destination, bypassing the intermediate waypoints. For CTAS, our workload consisted of a recorded radar feed from w, BFW. An earlier version of CTAS contained a bug in the flight plan processing that resulted in uh, inconsistent fl flight plans being generated. It turns out that uh, parsing flight plans is actually quite complex because the uh, flight plan streams were originally intended for humans to read. Uh, our fault insertion attempts to simulate an error in flight plan processing that results in a bad airport index being inserted into the flight plan data structure. Without repair, an error in the flight plan of a single aircraft can cause the entire system to crash with the segmentation fault. With repair, one aircraft may have a different origin or destination, but the system as a whole continues to execute, and the anomaly is eventually flushed from the system when the affected aircraft lands. CTES has many properties that make it ideal for... Okay, it's a good question. In our current system, it essentially generates a log of, you know, inconsistency to detect it, uh, repairs performed, things like that. But you're probably wondering, well, how well can the user understand that? And we're actually kind of interested in exploring essentially maybe tainting mechanisms that would allow the application to have some idea of what portions of the state are tainted by the repair algorithm or essentially tainted by the bug. And then maybe perhaps uh, 
you know, using this information to communicate to the user visually or something like that. Yeah. Did you have a question? So, so the thing to keep in mind is that there are humans inside of this loop, right? So that um, even if you have a, an aircraft with some sort of inconsistent value, the flight or the uh, the air, uh, air traffic controllers are supposed to keep track of all the planes that are in the air, and so they should notice a problem with a single aircraft. You can imagine some difficulties, though, if that if they essentially lose all information about aircraft. They don't know where any of the aircraft in the, are in the sky. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind in the specific examples, that there's a human in the loop, and if there's a bug, the human probably can notice that and you know uh, enter new information for that flight plan. OK. So our fourth application is a simplified Linux file system. Uh, some of the consistency properties for this file system are shown in the figure. Uh, an example of a consistency property for the file system are that the bitmaps are consistent with the usage of structures on the disk. We ran the file system with a workload that writes and verifies several files. We simulated a power failure by shutting down the file system in the middle of a write. This potentially results in inode and block bitmap errors, along with partially initialized directory and inode entries. Without repair, we observed incorrect file contents because of inode and disk block sharing. With repair, the bitmaps are repaired, preventing the legal sharing from occurring and yielding correct file contents. Our final application is FreeSiv, an interactive game. The world in FreeSiv consists of a grid of tiles, with each tile having a train value and an optional reference to city. The consistency properties for FreeSiv are that the uh, tiles have valid terrains, the cities are not placed in the middle of the ocean, and that each city has exactly one reference from the grid. Okay, and here you can see a screenshot of the FreeSiv game. We used the built-in test mode of FreeSiv to have the software play against itself. We use fault insertion to randomly corrupt terrain values. Without repair, the game always ends with a segmentation fault. With repair, the game plays out just fine for our test runs, but may play out differently because of the different terrain values. So what lessons do we learn from the experience of writing specifications? First, that the specifications are relatively small compared to the size of the system. And this is because the size of the specifications grows with the complexity of the data structure and not with the complexity of the source code. Second, the specifications are straightforward to develop once you understand the consistency properties. However, there is the potential to omit properties, and if the uh, developer isn't already familiar with the source code, the overhead of understanding the data structures can be quite significant. We developed an automatic specification inference tool to address these issues. Our tool is based on the dynamic invariant detection tool, Daikin, written by Michael Erst. The developer simply reviews the generated specifications, and we've used this tool to successfully infer specifications for two of our benchmarks, CTAS and FreeCiv. For CTAS, the inferred specifications contained all the constraints in the hand-coded specification and additional constraints on the arrival and departure runways. However, we observed different abstractions in the manually developed and inferred specifications. The inferred specification for FreeCiv is uh, missing the properties about the placement of cities on the grid due to a limitation of icon. However, the inferred specification contained previously overlooked values, or previously overlooked properties about the continents field of a tile and the initial positions of the players. And we observed similar abstractions in the manually developed and inferred specifications. OK, so uh, with an automatic uh, specification inference tool, essentially has to generate a very straightforward abstraction, right? So it maps objects to sets, fields to relations, things like that. So essentially it maps all flights to you know, a set of flights. Uh, and the automatically, or the, rather, the hand-developed specification would map departures to one set arrivals to another set. So you know, we essentially look at what type of flight is this and map it to a different set. 
Yes. Yes. And would that impact the tariff? Not in this case, but I think it impacts the ability of the uh, automatic inference tool to generate specifications. Like I, I have a really hard time imagining the automatic or automatic inference tool developing a specification for the file system benchmark. Okay. So hand cut uh, repair routines have been used in many implemented systems. Two such systems are the Lucent 5ESS telephone switch and the IBM MBS operating system. Database researchers have developed systems that uh, repair inconsistencies in uh, databases. Okay, some programming languages include constraint mechanisms as a programming language abstraction. Um, Self-stabilizing algorithms seek to provide correct results even in the presence of errors. Log-based recovery for database systems reverts any operations that uh, leave the database in an inconsistent state. The recovery-oriented computing project at Berkeley and Stanford has developed micro-recovery and micro-reboot, a method for building systems out of many independently rebootable modules, and an undo framework that allows a system allows a user to rewind many operations, perform some sort of configuration change, and then replay those operations. And finally, our consistency constraints are similar to uh, many object modeling languages, such as Alloy or UML. So in the future, I'd like to explore other mechanisms to build de uh, more decoupled software systems. My current technique helps prevent inconsistencies in data structures from propagating through software systems. So I'd like to develop techniques to build software systems with uh, decoupled control dependencies. And as a result, makes a, a software more resistant to fault propagating through control dependencies. I'd also like to look at uh, enabling more frequent consistency checking by either using page protection mechanisms in hardware to incrementally check specifications, or use static analysis to eliminate unnecessary checks. In conclusion, data structure repair is an exciting way to improve the reliability of software. My specification-based uh, approach promises to make the technique more widely applicable. Uh, the automatic inference of specifications promises to make developing specifications even easier. And in conclusion, I believe that this work is an important step in moving towards a more robust, probabilistic, continuous concept of system behavior for software systems. And I'd like to open to any questions. Okay. So I think the first uh, answer to this is essentially the user of the software needs to evaluate essentially the context that they're using the software in. Um, the, essentially, the developer can look at the repair dependence graph and see, well, for a given constraint violation, how is the system going to repair those violations? So there are essentially no, there, there are no unexpected repairs if you look at the repair dependence graph. Um, but I think it's something that the, essentially the developer needs to reason about on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. So you can find out in advance that the uh, in your hospital example that it's going to randomly assign operation by looking at the repair dependence graph and go, well, you know, if this constraint's violated, it's randomly selecting a operation from the set of operations and assigning it to this person. And go, hmm. As a developer of this hospital system, go, uh, think, well, it's probably not exactly what I wanted. Um. But maybe you're wondering, like for the file system example, how did the system select free blocks as opposed to use blocks or other blocks? And we have essentially mechanisms for the developer to provide hints about where to allocate objects when you need them, things like that.
Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can pick up the uh, graph. So whenever we generate a pair algorithm, we generate, um, let me, we uh, generate essentially the pruned repair dependence graph, right? So you can say, well, if I violate this constraint here, what's going to happen as a result of that? And you can look at essentially the trans, uh, what's reachable from this node and go, well, here are the repairs that that can trigger. Or, you know, if I violate this constraint, well, what might I change? Well, I might, the repair might add a block to the bitmap set might change to this particular state in my file system. And, oh, if I add a block to the bitmap set, well, this might violate this other constraint here, and this might result in this change. So you can really essentially look at these graphs and see, well, if this a given constraint's violated, how is the system going to react at a pretty high level? Yeah, but you would expect either that, well, okay. So there's one of two possibilities, right? One possibility is that I write a specific uh, data structure and the constraints for that data structure and violation or repair stay within my domain, right? In which case, it's perfectly reasonable. The other system is, you know, I write a uh, data structure, he writes a data structure, and we have essentially these cross-cutting constraints, in which case, you probably do have to reason about, you know, these cross-cutting constraints. So you need to ch essentially check these repair dependence graphs if you really care specifically about how the data structure is repaired. Yes. Yeah, I think the developer really needs to think about this. I mean, let's suppose I'm developing some sort of numerical simulation for a scientific application in which I really want a high confidence that the end result's perfectly right, right? If I'm doing that sort of thing, uh, oh, and the other thing is that if it crashes, I have a developer to come and fix it, right? Uh, in that sort of domain, I would expect that, you know, you certainly wouldn't want to apply repair. But I think there are a lot of other applications where developers are not really thinking about essentially uh, what are all the possible operations I can perform, but they're thinking, well, they're thinking more about, well, I have this doubly linked list and it has these certain properties. So they're thinking more of essentially consistency properties of data structures, and they're really designing their uh, code in, in terms of consistency properties. And so if you hand this code a consistent data structure, it's probably going to perform reasonable thing, uh, operations. And an example might be a file system where, you know, I run a file system code on a file system, and the developer doesn't really care that, you know, the file system crashed, Windows crashed last week, I rebooted the system, and I lost some files. It really cares that the file system is consistent uh, with respect to the abstract model in the developer's head. Yeah. I think there are a lot of systems where, you know, the decision's really tough, right? Where stopping the system and crashing is clearly disastrous, but, you know, well, maybe I'm not all that comfortable with perhaps some state being changed either. And 
that's a decision you have to make. You don't have a beast. You don't have a third option that we'd like where I have the bug-free version, right? So you have option A or B, and you have to choose which one's better. So we started off by looking at you know other specification languages like Alloy, things like that, with essentially uh, two uh, two motivations. First, that we could express interesting properties for data structures. Um, but second, that we could repair those properties, right? And so there's a sort of fine line you're trying to walk between adding enough uh, adding enough power to the specification language that it can capture the properties I want to talk about but uh, still be able to repair violations. Okay. My current implementation, or? <laughs> OK. So you're wondering about, essentially, uh, times to check consistency properties and perform repairs. OK. So it's at least my opinion that what we really should care about is essentially that the checks are fairly cheap, because they're being executed pretty frequently, and that the repairs are reasonably cheap in such that you can tolerate the time that it takes to repair, but they sh certainly shouldn't drive the performance of the application. Um, I guess perhaps someone could write a bug enough system that relied on repair that it really needed it, but I would expect most systems would have perhaps repair themselves once a day, once a week, once a month, maybe never. So for the benchmarks we looked at, uh, their consistency checking times varied from uh, less than a tenth of a millisecond to about four milliseconds. Uh, these were performed on 866 megahertz uh, ThinkPad laptop. Um, so, the file system's relatively big data structure. It's eight megabytes big. Um, I think I don't know the count offhand of blocks. And FreeSiv is also a relatively big data structure because it's you know essentially a huge grid of tiles that you're checking consistent properties on. It depends on the application. For the file system, it's essentially uh, upon boot. For uh, FreeSiv, it's once every round in the game. The game's one of these sort of round game, uh, thing, strategy games. Um, for C tests, it's gets once every flight uh, every time you uh, add a new flight plan to the system. Just check the the flight plan. And for Abby, where it's essentially every time you add something new to the uh, piece table. But yeah, there's this uh, interesting performance question where essentially the larger data structures and more consistency properties I want to check, you know, essentially the more expensive the checks are going to become, um, and the more frequently I want to check these properties, the more expensive. Uh, which is really why we're looking at essentially trying to partially check specifications or partially check data structures or incrementally check them. Um, what was your sec? Oh, would I fly in an aircraft? Um, so I guess the question is, let's see. I'd probably prefer to fly in a non-fly-by-wire aircraft. But if I'm given the choice between the aircraft that has my tool and doesn't have my tool, I'll probably take the one that has my tool, because I know that it's no worse than the other one. And perhaps, well, Yeah, I guess you could write a specification that kicks in at the wrong time, but I'm the specifications are probably at a, or in general at a much higher level than the code. So I'm guessing that for the most part, repairs can probably make things better, uh, and unlikely to make things worse. And you could also imagine some of these systems where you know you have a 
a controller interfacing with the real world, you can essentially perhaps view the interface with the real world as a data structure and run essentially consistency checks on the commands they present to the real world. Like you can imagine maybe an elevator controller, where whenever the elevator tries to the elevator controller tries to uh, essentially interact with the, uh, the hardware, that you perform a consistency check on the commands. So you, perhaps you, you know you don't allow the lift to move if the doors open, things like that, where you can use essentially repair to enforce some high-level safety properties. Yes. So you could presumably do it like much more regularly, which is very cheap. Uh, the point of doing that is to believe that as objects are communicating, at some point in the future, you can have more and more random bits of inconsistent data structure that can appear from the wall. That's yes, definitely true. As long as you only check the properties when the data structure is supposed to be consistent. So I think there are some contributions along that direction. And they're mostly of the, how can we write consistency properties in a sort of high-level declarative fashion and then still connect this to the low-level data structures? Um, so it's mostly in sort of this translation of data structures to a higher-level abstraction and a nice language for expressing these properties. I think a lot of it's driven by the ability to perform repair. And you could certainly, I think you could check a lot more properties if you didn't have to repair them. You know, a lot of, in general, it's easier to check an answer than to generate an answer, right? So you, you would make different trade offs and you'd be able to check much more uh, complex properties. Although I think perhaps what I think is the contribution along this sort of checking direction is this sort of translation specification. How do we, how do we specify in a nice way how to traverse data structures, like linked lists, things like that? And this sort of, you know, adding, uh, finding a, you know, starting off with a root, adding it to the set, then, you know, looking at every element in the set and adding essentially the next element of the set, sort of allowing you to specify that at a high level, I think, is a useful uh, contribution. <laughs> 